Okay, we're back. We're live. It's a given Wednesday. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Community Matters. We have Mike DeWert, our chief scientist. We're going to talk about the relationship between economic activity uh, in reopening and increased mortality in COVID cases. This is a very important discussion. Before we do that, I just want to make a historical benchmark. Um, today was the day the Department of Justice uh, asked David Ige to, uh, uh, to stop uh, imposing quarantine on trips from the mainland. Uh, first, the administration says, you governors, you go do things, uh, and if you don't do them right, we'll blame you. Um, we take the credit, you take the blame sort of thing. And we did do something, uh, the Department of Justice tells them not to do what they wanted to do. But the, my favorite part is uh, the Court of Appeals <clears throat> reversed uh, Judge Sullivan. Uh, and said that um, he had to treat the charges against uh, Mike Flynn as withdrawn, which is a, you know, a, a violation of the rule of law. The, the rule of law, she is gone. Uh, it's a terrible day. Mike and I will get over that. We're going to talk about this. Maybe this will make us feel better, Mike. Maybe. <laughs> but they call economic the dismal science for a reason. We'll be talking about that. <laughs> so we've, we've had this discussion on the periphery before. We've talked about what the numbers say, you know, and, and uh, projections for how the, the cases and mortality uh, numbers are, are increasing or will increase. Um, and surely that's happening now. But, but a very important discussion is to adjust reopening and, uh, and with the mortality figures and to try to figure out what, what's in our toolkit so that we can adjust the reopening in such a way as to uh, keep the mortality cases and the mortality numbers at acceptable levels. This is not easy. I don't think the government thinks like this, um, but Mike has made an analysis and we really have to hear it and the government should hear it also. So tell us your latest thinking on the relationship, Mike. Well, let's, let's go review uh, what we uh, talked about in June 1st. Uh, first slide sort of a review of that. Um, we, we know that to achieve herd immunity via infection in Hawaii, we'll probably have to have a million people get sick. And if we have the current death rate, we have 26,000 of them will die on route to herd immunity. Now, um, herd immunity is a pretty darn defensive term applied to human beings, not just fungible production units like cattle to be you know, treated as you know, one more, one less, who cares? So this is really serious. If we do manage to cut the death rate in half towards only, only the New Zealand death rate of 1.3%, we'd still lose 13,000 people. So we're asking you know, thousands of our fellow citizens to die in order to reopen the economy quickly. And in, to put it in context, as we mentioned on June 1st, the annual death rate in Hawaii from all causes before COVID-19 was like 11,500. So 13,500 is more than a whole year's worth of casualties from all of the causes put together. And that's what we're asking for. In the best case, the healthcare system doesn't collapse. Um, so, and what we also went over on June 1st was that economic recessions, even as bad as the Great Depression, save lives, they don't cost lives. Uh, mortality goes down, went down during the Great Depression and life expectancy at birth went up during the Great Depression. And the effects are bigger for minority communities. Minority people gain seven years of life expectancy. Whites gain four years of life expectancy during the Great Depression. And these are huge numbers you know, for any kind of public health policy. So when you look at the face of it, you look at lives versus lives, there's no contest. Keep the economy locked down as much as you need to to keep the death rate from going up. You know? And that's. Um, that's hard ask. So then that brings up today's question as well. If we decide to open up the economy and we're going to accept casualties, what is the cost of a human life? What is the value of human life? That's a serious question that economists have actually looked at and studied. So, so we can't really set an objective value in human life. There's no criteria for saying what is human life worth, you know. But you can ask, you can ask people how much they're willing to accept in order to risk their lives. And um, an economist named um, Tom Schelling, who got a Nobel Prize in 2005, actually did this in 1981. He went and he looked at jobs that required similar skills, but at different levels of risk. You know, you're more likely to die in this job versus that job, even though you need the same skills to do them. And he looked at the pay difference required to entice people into that riskier job. 
And he found that in 1981, the implied value of a human life was about $3.1 million. Now, since then, um, uh, other economists have updated the analysis, done more sophisticated versions of it. And in 2020 dollars, the value of a human life is about $10 million. So that's where we are. So the value of a human life. Now, there's a few catches and gotchas. Rich people tend to ask to accept lower risk. Poor people tend to be a little more desperate, accept more risk. That implies that poor people's lives are worth less than rich people's lives. That's simply not an acceptable thing for our society to implement. So, but so let's go with the ten million dollars for human life. Um, and that that article is a long analysis done in Wired magazine on May 11 on this. So they've applied um, this this kind of method. It's called a value value of a statistical life VSL method to the COVID 19 virus. And uh, this was done at University of Wyoming and been done in other places too. But University of Wyoming, what they did is they computed the cost of not doing anything in terms of dollars. You know, our economy will take a hit because if 2% of your customers die, well, okay, it was 2% less GDP. Um, and, and all the other things that go with, with letting, it, letting people just die, let the virus run. Um, they, so the, the cost of doing nothing uh, plus the cost of the lives lost if you do nothing, and they compared that to the cost of social distancing they can find it to that, plus the uh, cost of lives saved through social distancing and made some pretty fairly optimistic assumptions about how many lives they could save. But they, they, they did make some realistic assumptions, but a little opt on the optimistic side of things. And they found that the net, the difference between shutting the economy down and saving lives and letting the economy run and whatever happens, happens is about five over $5 trillion, $5 trillion saved with a shutdown, social distancing and reducing the casualties. That's far more than the stimulus so far. So the, and that's with regard to both the, uh, the, the debit side and the credit side. Right. The 5 yeah. trillion is, is a net out number. Yeah. Right, yeah, net out number. $5 trillion is the, is the net uh, when you take economic cost plus value of lives saved or lives lost, you know, as the case may be. Okay. Uh, now, we, and I've just seen a similar analysis for Hawaii. Economists, I hope that you hero are working on this. If they are, they're probably keeping it quiet because um, uh, if we assume that we lose 26,000 people um, with, by doing nothing, and that's an optimistic assumption because that assumes the healthcare system would completely collapse. That's, that's, um, that, that that value of that uh, 26,000 times $10 million is something like $260 billion, $260 billion, $260 billion. $260 billion. And if we cut that in half, we're only losing $130 billion of lives lost. Our entire economy in, 19, in 2016, 2016 was only worth like $73 billion. I mean, the value of the lives we're saving by going slow and reopening in a way that only gives us 13,000 casualties um, is twice, almost twice our gross domestic product for a whole year. And we know the economy isn't gonna to go to zero. So the value is, is, is far greater of what we're gonna save by leaving the economy shut down or opening it up carefully and slowly with regard to how many people we're gonna lose. Um, now, in places where they tried to open quickly, they've had some bad consequences. Like in Serbia and Croatia, they let Novak Djokovic, the number one tennis player in the world, organize a charity tour of tennis pros playing you know, throughout the Adriatic countries. Um, they uh, had no social distancing. The players partied at night. You know, They played basketball together at night. They danced with their shirts off, swinging them over their heads at a disco. They let the audience come in, thousands of people with no masks, no social distancing. Well, Novak Djokovic came down with coronavirus. His wife came down with coronavirus. His coach came down with coronavirus. Three other highly ranked players came down with coronavirus and one of their coaches came down with coronavirus. And there's no word yet on the audience, how many came down with coronavirus. So we 
had an example where you have a sporting event. We expected maybe we could do some sporting events. Well, here's a sporting event where they just totally ignored any kind of uh, controls. And they've had consequences. Number one player in the world has coronavirus. And by the way, this guy, you know that joke batch, also is an anti-vaxxer. He had declared that he would not get the coronavirus vaccine if it was available, even if it was required for him to go to international tournaments. Now, this is, I, this is hubris. It's also a delusion of insulating privilege. He thinks because he's young and fit, he won't die of it. Well, that's great for him. But what about the people he may give it to? And what about his wife? What about his family? Um, so this, this is a cautionary tale. Now, other tennis tournaments are going on in the world. But in France, for example, there's no audience. There's nobody in the stands. The players aren't allowed to shake hands. The players are supposed to maintain social distance when they're not on the court. Um, and the balls, they don't, they don't touch the balls, except, you know, if a player has touched the ball, nobody else touches it, it gets scooped up and put away without a person touching it. So they're really careful about maintaining social distance. And the U.S. Open has declared, the U.S. Open tennis tournament, they're going to do a tournament in August. Well, they're going to have to have it without an audience. And that's going to be very interesting. Um, <laughs> yeah, to be in New York with no, no crowd. Um, and the French Opens declared they're going to go in, in September. Well, we'll see how that goes. So we'll see how the right now with the tournaments they are doing with social distancing right now around France and see how that goes. Um, and this isn't just, I'm not, I don't want to just pick on Serbia and Croatia. We're seeing this in this country, Arizona, Florida, California, Texas, they're all seeing big spikes when they try to open their economies. And just this morning, in the news, in the Star Advertiser's article at Myrtle Beach, they opened Myrtle Beach up for tourism. And you see tourists crowded into, with no masks, with a swimmer on, just um, breathing into each other's faces in the elevators. Um, they've had a big spike in coronavirus cases. Right now, they're having their cases double every nine days in Myrtle Beach. Ooh. And West Virginia traced a bunch of cases in West Virginia, two people had gone to Myrtle Beach for vacation. And now they're cautioning people to don't do that. Um, it's, it's, we're, we're seeing the effects. And now this is, this could be an example for Hawaii. You know, Myrtle Beach's approach isn't gonna work because we get 10 million visitors a year. Um, and if you only miss, one in a thousand, well, still 10,000 imported cases that then it seeds throughout our community. Well, there's an element there where, where okay, if you have a, a resurgence like that, a lot of cases in the states you mentioned, yeah. they can't stop it so easily. It has, right. it has a, an afterlife and, and that goes out logarithmically into the community. So yeah. once, you, once you let go of this wild horse, you don't know where it's going to go. Well, you know it's going to go up. Uh, this right. is a big problem, and so so for for them to say, oh, now we're gonna we're gonna put the same social distancing rules back in place. The horse, she is out of the barn, and you got to do more than that, right? Right, and we're we're seeing a problem here in the in the United States, and maybe in the rest of the world, with this danger of complacency. We think um, we, it's the paradox of prevention. We think that because we prevented a bunch of deaths, we don't see the deaths that didn't happen. We just see that there aren't any deaths when these places that are locked down. So we just think, oh, you were lying. It's not that big a deal. The disaster didn't happen. So let's relax all the controls. Well, now the disaster will happen and people will, heads will roll, there will be blame, but it's, it'll be too late. Um, and the politicians have to make a decision. They should be honest with us. Either they're gonna say, um, we're going to, let people die and we're going to sacrifice human lives for the economy and we're going to make that trade they can be honest with us about that or they can be honest with us and say we're going to like winston churchill winston, winston churchill he when the nazis were knocking on the door getting ready to invade britain and he was at war and he knew his country was in peril he didn't say oh to go away miraculously just go shop he said i have nothing to offer you but blood and toil and tears and sweat. And that galvanized the people to unite, get together, work together and get through it. I mean, it was four years of hell for Britain, for the world, um, but they, they toughed it out. We could do the same thing. This is a war. 
We need a leader who'll get up there and say, if we get together, work together, we'll suffer a few years of privation and a few years of hardship. We will get as many of us to the other side as possible. Well, the question is, what's in the kit bag? The question yeah. is, uh, you know, you, I mean, as, as your your paper that you sent me was was really wonderful, and <clears throat> the idea is, you you have to match these things. If you see mortality going up, cases and mortality going up, then you take more of those tools out of your kit bag and you turn the faucet one way or the other. So to diminish uh, social distancing, I mean, to to put more controls in place and right. maybe not not reopen so quickly in order to reduce the number of cases. I mean, so what, what, is, what is the relationship that you have to be looking at? How do you find out what, what the risks are that way and what's in the kit bag? Oh, well, of course, what's in the kit bag is, you know, wash your hands, social distancing, wear a mask. You know, um, they, there's been a lot of controversy about how hard it is to tell whether masking is effective because it's hard to, most places that require masking also require social distance. They say, well, is it the social distance or the masking? But um, studies where they have people breathe on petri dishes through masks show that a mask can reduce what gets onto the petri dish by 90%. That's not enough for a doctor who sees hundreds of patients a week, but a cloth mask is enough. 90% reduction in risk is enough to re greatly reduce the community's risk when you're going shopping or something like that. So we need to keep requiring masking. Um, they don't, the states that are seeing the worst spikes aren't requiring the masking. And some of the governors say, oh, I have no plan to, re to require masking. And it's like, well, this is stupid. It's been in the countries that have effectively stopped this thing, Taiwan, um, Singapore, masking is what everybody does. Your mask protects me, my mask protects you. Um, what else is the kit bag testing? Um, I've had a COVID-19 test. It's not a lot of fun. I mean, the probe went up my nose and I felt like it was coming out of my eye socket, but tested negative, okay. And it only took a day and a half to get the results back. So I think the state's idea of requiring people who from the mainland who want to come here to get a COVID-19 test or choose to be quarantined is a good idea. I mean, you can get the results back in a couple of days. They can get on the airplane, come here. Juan is on the airplane. The institute controls, you know, every middle seat empty, maybe with a plastic barrier, people wearing masks on the airplane. We we have to do this safely. Uh, people can about, get here. What about tracking? Oh, well, yeah, contact tracing. Um, like I said, the West Virginia case is they found that they traced to Myrtle Beach. They, they were able to trace them. If you don't test and you don't do follow up contact tracing, you never figure out where the source of the infection is and it stays seated in your community, causing more problems to pop up later on. So we could, we should ramp up contact tracing. Now it takes training people, you know, kind of people are nice. We like to talk to people. We're good at talking to people and eliciting information of who have you seen, who have you been with, where have you been, so that we can do the contact tracing. Um, we want to do it in the least invasive way possible, you know, because we, we are a free open society. We have rights, you can't say, you must tell us. You may say, can you just please tell us? Uh, but we got to do the tracing. We got to do the contract tracing. Well, um, so far, the, what you're talking about in the kit bag, um, it's uh, this, there's a lot of complacency that has displaced any significant effort. A lot right. of people I can see even in Honolulu and maybe more on the mainland, they have set aside their masks or right. they may wear masks in such a way so the mask doesn't cover anything. <clears throat> I yeah. see so many people with masks dropped down in, uh, on their chin and both their nose and their mouth are exposed. I don't know why they wear it at all. Uh, <clears throat> and then, of course, uh, I, I don't think that uh, tracing has really been implemented in most right. of the country. It hasn't been implemented here. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so that's a huge item in the, in the toolkit, uh, yeah. a kit bag that, that isn't being used. Um, mm -hmm. And let's see, what, what were the other things you mentioned? Well, social distancing. Seems like people are going complacent on that too. Oh. I think what happened here is, you know, when uh, the president announced we're back, we've licked this thing, which was not true, yeah. and one of those many falsehoods. Um, everybody took that as a message they could be complacent. Right. But then we have complacency. Now you, now you turn around 
Uh, I don't think the federal government is doing check on this, but now you turn around and, and the states are saying, okay, it's time to get back to a more disciplined approach. And people say, nah, nah, we don't need to do that. That's, that's old news. We're gonna keep on being complacent. I think it's a, it's a, public, uh, a public reaction thing, don't you? Yeah, I think it is. And, and, and it, well, it, it, the leadership would help with that. I mean, if we had a leader like Churchill or Roosevelt who would say, you know, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself, you know, just, or, or let's work together, let's get through this together. We don't have leaders uniting us to, in, in this war against this virus. We have leaders dividing us. And that's, it's crazy. Um, we're not gonna be through this virus until there's a vaccine. And even today, Anthony Fauci says, look, we're talking into 2021 before we can roll out a vaccine. It's been shown to be safe and effective. And he says he's not gonna roll out one that's not safe. And um, which is good because we've already seen like hydroxychloroquine killed more people than it saved in, in the Veterans Administration and other, and even in the bill. So we want a safe, effective thing. We can't get a vaccine for at least a year, maybe a year and a half optimistically. So we gotta maintain controls for then. We may get treatment sooner um, there's just a study in um, yesterday that came out uh, from the Harry Medical College that Dr. J James Alcindor, he's, he's done a lot of research on Zika. It turns out that the coronavirus has some similarities to Zika. He found a way to prevent 95% of Zika virus replication in, in, in humans. And so he's going to try a similar approach with coronavirus. Uh, the next step is to test on lab animals, make sure it's safe. But he could have a treatment that keeps people from dying of coronavirus in six months if it works. And there's a lot of other places working on treatments. So it's a treatments it will be in the kit bag sometime before the end of this year, but don't rush. I mean- well, But yeah, so we know how many cases there are. I mean, aside from Donald Trump's remark, which I don't think was a, a joke at all. We've all uh, seen him deliver that statement. It was not a joke where he said uh, he was cutting back on testing because testing revealed too many cases. But putting that aside, we do have numbers pretty much on cases and mortalities, and you can get that information. Okay, that's one side of the, the, the algorithm, I suppose. The other side of these things in this uh, kit bag, uh, the problem is that the two problems there is it's hard to quantify exactly what you're doing with the tools in the kit bag. How are you going to make an algorithm that connects cases and deaths um, to actually Im implementing what's in the kit bag? And the other thing is the kit bag requires leadership, as you say, it requires cooperation, coordination, it requires public acceptance, which right. that's, very, that's social science, that's pretty vague. Right. So right. what would you advise our, our government to do right now based on the fact that we do have an upswing. Uh, other states have an even more pronounced upswing. Um, what do you take out of the kit bag right now? Do you go back to the full lockdown? Is, is there a way to adjust the numbers of the, of the tools in the kit bag? Well, okay, so what they have found in South Korea is opening up bars is dangerous. Okay, people don't want, when they get a little bit of liquor in them, they don't wanna be socially distant. But in France, they found maybe opening restaurants is safer if you enforce social distancing and the waiters wear masks, the patrons wear masks so they sit down in front of their food. Maybe you can open restaurants. Um, you probably can't open a food court, but you can open, unless you can do social distancing now. So there's things that we're learning as we go along, learn from what other, pe other, other people's mistakes, you know? Yeah, don't have a stadium full of people like the Adria tour. You know, if the athletes come for a competition, don't let them party and dance at night together. You know, make them practice social distancing. Um, we, we can't do the Honolulu Marathon. There's just no way to do social distancing with 26,000 runners. But those other events we might be able to do. You know, like I say, maybe the Molokai to Oahu canoe race, they could get the athletes to social distance. And they're in the, when they're in the boat, okay, there's only six of them in the boat together. So at least that, that group is socially distant from the other boats. So maybe they could do those kinds of events. Well, we're talking about factors. I mean, one factor is uh, is um, <laughs> when you when you shout or speak, um, you're spreading virus. 
Right. Uh, when you have a lot of people shouting and speaking in a in a small area, whether it be indoors or outdoors, but much worse indoors, you're yeah. leaving that the virus hanging in the air for who knows for quite some time. Um, mm. And I suppose uh, it you know we we used to think it was only a few uh, virion particles that right. you know that that did it, but it, no, it's a it's an accumulation of virion particles. So if you're there for a long time and you pick up a lot of these particles, you're you're really going to be in trouble. And so yeah. all these factors work and you have to apply these factors, hopefully a numerical basis to all of human activity. Right. And the masking is effective if it's done right. Now, saying that people don't wear the masks right, therefore we shouldn't bother with it. That's like saying people don't wear their seat belts right, therefore we shouldn't bother with it. Statistically, seat belts save lives, even yeah. though people don't wear them right. Okay. <laughs> so if, if, if everybody is wearing a mask and a few people can't figure out how to wear them right, we still will save lives. And so, so masking is the number one thing. I mean, they've even had anecdotal cases um, where like a hairdresser who had COVID and didn't know it, she was wearing a mask, her customers were wearing a mask, dozens of customers, none of them got sick. So um, that doesn't mean that, 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 so some people say, well, it means the virus isn't that bad. No, 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 it means that the masking worked in this case. And they've had other cases where the masking has been shown to, and, and at least in several anecdotes, help, you know, where other cases where people weren't masked were interacting like the Adria tour, basket, pick up basketball game, people got sick. So, and, or the choir practice in New Hampshire, or was it Vermont? Vermont, where everybody got sick because they were singing together, of course, spreading the virus out. Nobody's wearing a mask. And cute like half the choir got sick yeah so oh, yeah yeah so yeah so what you, you say you're right it's this spreading of the virus particles the droplets and even finer particles you know down to nanometer scales wearing a mask reduces that and if it only reduces at 90 percent that's not good enough for a doctor but it is good enough for a community to greatly reduce the risk and the rate of transmission of this disease um and then we just got to well, let, let, let me assume for a minute that there's not going to be an easy therapeutic here uh, yeah. at any at any stage of the disease. And there's not going to be a, a vaccine until, well, optimistically sometime in 2021. Um, and it's not clear that A, that will work as hoped, and B, that it will be able to be delivered to the world. And, and C, that people will take it like that anti-vaxxer in, in Serbia. Uh, so. The, the question is, um, you know, we hear about testing. We, we yeah. hear that there is better testing than, than putting a swab up and, you know, up way up your nose. Um, mm -hmm. and, that, and that instead of a day and a half, which is good against what it was a couple months ago, which is more like a week or 10 days, um, there, there are, there's talk about various competitive technologies that can mm -hmm. test you in a less invasive way on a swab for your mouth, for example, and that can return a result <laughs> almost immediately in minutes. Now, right. wouldn't that be a great addition to the kit bag? Sure, sure it would be. Um, you need to make sure that those tests have a very low false negative rate. Um, and the one up your nose is a negligible false, false positive rate. So that's good. I mean, a false positive causes you to chase people and do contact tracing and waste resources. So it's good. It needs to have a very low false positive rate and a very low false negative rate. Um, so whatever they roll out. Um, the other thing is we we need our leaders to be honest with us because if there is no vaccine if that doesn't come to to come materialize in the next two years, if there's no therapeutic treatment that cures the disease, they need to tell us straight up. We're going to accept 13,000 casualties in Hawaii. We're going to let that, we're just going to, have to accept that. Here's the schedule. Here's the time frame over which we're going to try to make that happen so we can achieve herd immunity. And there's no guarantee that we will achieve herd immunity, even because the virus may not provide permanent immunity. Mm. Well, so what that, about what about somebody like you and me? We, we're careful, knock wood. Um, we don't get it, right? And then somebody, somebody says something, headline in the newspaper, good news, 
we have we have achieved herd immunity. 60, 70 percent, whatever of the population have actually had the disease, and that, and that by all scientific calculations, we have achieved herd immunity. Does right. that does that headline help me? Does it help you? If you haven't had it, you could still have it. Does, does that herd immunity protect protect me? Well, it, so so then what they would have to do is keep tracking how many disease cases there are. So once you've achieved herd immunity, it means that um, if somebody gets the disease, even if they're out there interacting with people, less than one person will get it from them, which means that an outbreak will die out. So, and it means that you're far less likely to run into somebody who has the disease, therefore. But they need to keep tracking how many cases there are and publicize them so we can calculate what our risk is. Right now in Hawaii, it's like one in a thousand. That you, if you're a random stranger you run into, there's only one in a thousand chance they have the disease, thanks to the restrictions we put on here, especially restrictions on tourism. Um, on the mainland, it's more like one in a hundred. And in some places, it's way higher than that. Um, you know, if I'm interacting with the public, you know, as a restaurant server, and you know, there's hundreds of customers coming through a day, and you know, there's a one percent chance that any one of them will have it. I'm like, I'm going to meet a customer with the COVID. I mean, that's yeah. that'd be crazy. my luck, you know, that'd be my luck. I'll meet the one. <laughs> so you get it down, for like one in a thousand yeah. chance that you're running well. into something. And Almost out of time, and uh, I wanted to um, finish. Please finish. Oh, no, I'm just, I'm just amplifying what you're saying. Is that what's in the kit bag? Is if our leaders are honest about us, with us, telling us, you know, we're going to have to accept casualties. We're going to accept uh, two deaths a day for the next four and a half years, which is what we talked about last show, is what it would take to get to herd immunity. That takes political courage but they need to be honest with us so we can all pitch in and do what we have to do to keep it from getting worse than that. Because it could easily be much, much worse. That We could easily lose 30,000 people instead of 13,000 people. Funny that all the people who talk to us about this, who have the ear of the press, so to speak, and have press conferences, uh, they are political people, all mm -hmm. of them. <clears throat> and um, they, they're therefore... Um, motivated uh, not to panic us, uh, to keep the lid on things, to make it look uh, maybe a little rosier than it is. And what you're saying is not, is not rosy, but it's scientific and, and it's the reality. And uh, you, wrote, you wrote this paper, which impressed me so much. And, and you. Um, you know, to me, it's important that that paper, uh, the policy points in that paper and the possi possibilities of policy points um, get to the policymakers. Mm -hmm. We really need that to happen. We don't, we don't want a, an incomplete story here. So what are you going to do? What can we do to get these reality points to the people who can, who can adjust our community to minimize cases and mortality? Yeah, I, well, certainly I can forward the, you know, the calculations to the policymakers. So the le legislature is back in session. So presumably they're going to do something um, while they're in session. It's not guaranteed. Um, of course, the governor and the mayor, you know, making a lot of the right noises, but there's, they're not telling us how many casualties they expect, nor are the Department of Health. But we need to get policymakers at least the information. I can, I can certainly forward them the paper. I can't guarantee they'll read it. That's, that's the problem, you know. And it takes political courage to be honest with people, to say either we're going to let the thing kill people and we're not going to treat the COVID people, we're going to let them die, or get the economy back up and running as quickly as possible. It takes courage to say that. It also takes courage to say, we're going to minimize the casualties as best we can by keeping the economy locked down uh, for as long as feasible until there's either treatment or, in, or for four and a half, whole four and a half years until we have herd immunity. And yeah. that's scary. And it's scary to say because that means you're going to accept casualties in the meantime. And well, we can never forget we're in a crisis. Yeah, you know, we can never forget that we're in a public health crisis and an economic crisis, and that we right. have to we have to mediate between these two. We have to spend the time and energy and right. the resources <laughs> to to define our community to be better resilient. So mm -hmm. what that means is, I hope you do uh, circulate the paper. I hope they read it, and uh, in any event. 
uh, we here on ThinkTech can present this in a, in a completely honest way. Uh, yeah. and, and so in a few weeks, Mike, I'd like to revisit this whole discussion, see how it went, see how it's going, see what other thoughts, what other calculations, what other right. suggestions you, you know you are making. There's a lot of science we can bring to bear on this and it's progressing quickly, fortunately. Yeah. So. Thank you, Mike. Mike DeWert, our, our chief scientist here at ThinkTech, uh, helping us understand the, uh, the true scope, nature and prospects of, of COVID um, and its effect on the economy. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Aloha.